this land was stolen from my ancestors. My grandfather and my great-grandfather spent six months in Okala prison for defying government. And to this day, no level of government has ever come back to my people to apologize for that. The government doesn't seem to recognize things like Aboriginal rights and title. They don't recognize that my people have a territory. And until government is ready to acknowledge the fact that uh, First Nations were here before the white people, then this fight's going to continue. I felt so bad when the loggers started. Most of the territories have been clear-cut and have um, what the government calls equivalent clear-cut area status. We have a territory and that territory needs to be recognized. A lot of times our people talk about, you know, the activities that are happening on the land that, that's really been ignored, whether it be too close to a spawning bed or interfering with a moose winter range or uh, roads are being developed. Uh, and that's been going on for a number of decades. And, and governments have come with a treaty model that says, well, forget about all of that. Go pick an area that, um, that you would like. Um, these are how many members you have. And this is the model of uh, land selection. And here's a bit of cash for you. And everything will be square. And don't ever raise your, your rights and title again in the future. If you travel the territory, you'll see, you know, they put Highway 37 through the territory, opening it up for more industry. Um, now they have mines that are coming through and they're, um, the devastation that's going to take place. You have the Northwest Transmission Line um, following an existing uh, 138 kV line and it's opening up the territory for for anybody and without the realization that the impacts are severe and that it will change not only the look of the territory but how we use it. So we spend a lot of time adapting to new new things that are evolving and sometimes it's very difficult. Our ancestors surveyed the trails and the government take over and they don't pay nothing to the people that's been living there for years and years. This log road is following our trap line, I said to him. All the trees are harvested on our trap line. My mother walked around. She looked at the trees and this is where we have our stories. You see what happened here? The loggers were plowing all over the place and destroying those stories. So I walked around and Come back to my mother and she was crying. We've lost medicines. Uh, we've lost wildlife. There's the depletion of moose and moose populations. And uh, government just continues to say, well, the land is crown land. Today, we're still standing on our ancestors' food. We're not going to give up. We have some success stories to share in terms of utilizing our land use plans to steer projects. Every decision that is made has to encompass the people within the lineage and the land. For us, <clears throat> the Kidnia, we've been here for a long time and um, we have a system that's very well intact here in Gitanya. We have the traditional house groups that we have. We have eight of them, and basically we have two clans in our community, the Wolf Clan and the 
the frog clan and the, the traditional structure is still very well intact. If you're looking at the box, you have the top of the box where the head chief is, then you have his wing chiefs. And if you go down around the outside of the box, there's all the wilt members. And then at the bottom of the box, there's a door where the matriarch of the wilt sits at the door. The wilt is a container like a box that holds the names of the hereditary names of the lineage. We have the head chief's name in our um, house or wilt. And when that person inherits that name, he inherits it for life. And for life he pays into the greater society for his entire life. He's never paid for that position. He's always paying out. The structure of how the clans work within the village is through um, the fee system. That's our, our um, social, political, economic unit and it's our governance is the fee system. We have a land use plan, and I'm really proud of that land use plan because it, it too reflects how we protect the territory. Um, government, you know, they say, well, you, you, you can only, you can log these areas and you can leave a small patch, what they call wildlife zones and etc and so forth but if you are out on the territory and you see the the devastation um, you'll understand why we went so far as to take again the knowledge of our our people and turn it into a document that can be read by by people instead of sitting in meetings and and talking in this very small section of these watersheds, approximately 80% of the Nass sockeye spawn. And the Nass sockeye being the third biggest sockeye run in BC, it's a lot of fish. And of course, when you have all those fish concentrated, you've got lots of wildlife concentrated there too. So some of the highest densities of grizzly bears in the world are in that area. BC Hydro wanted to put the line through there. Of course, with the transmission line, you have to put a road in and it's a delicate floodplain ecosystem. When you put a road into a floodplain, it acts like a dam, it changes the hydrology of the watershed. The Gitniaw said, that's not a good idea, that's gonna be a, pr a protected area. We think you should take the route over here. And because we had the land use plan, we had at least, we had considerable amounts of data on, on water values, grizzly bear values, moose values, mountain goat values for both those areas. And within the context of doing this EA process, we were able to quickly assist in developing a report that compared the two sections. And it was very clear after submitting that report that the route that the Gitanyal suggested was going to have a much smaller impact on salmon, water, wildlife than what BC Hydro proposed and uh, they changed the route. We document the history. When we do find remnants of our infrastructure like archaeology sites or, or trail systems or seasonal gathering areas, then we GPS them and put them on maps. And then when development, if development's going to happen in those particular areas, then we, um, we can engage in a meaningful way and we'd like accommodation in a meaningful way. We set up uh, temporary uh, salmon counting fences and sure enough the numbers were dangerously low where, where the stock was almost at risk of collapse and uh, losing it forever. Uh, these fish are genetically unique. Um, you know, once they're gone, they're gone forever. They're important from a, you know, a spiritual and a cultural perspective for the Gitanyao, but uh, also, you know, at one time they made up a good portion of their food fishery. So it was, uh, we took the task on to look at the problem. Uh, we identified, yes, that the numbers were really low. And then we uh, put together a rebuilding plan to try and uh, rebuild the stocks to more historical levels. Uh, we got funding to put in a, a permanent salmon counting facility at the mouth of the river. And uh, uh, one of the big successes of that program, it was set up to monitor sockeye numbers, but we were able through the through the implement, implementation of the program to monitor actually all five species of salmon coming back to the system 
to the point where now the Federal Fisheries Department use our data on a yearly basis in season and post season to uh, monitor the health of salmon stocks coming back to the Skeena watershed. There's a population of canyon mountain goats to the north of here that the Gitanyal recognized as being potentially vulnerable because they're easier to access, they're, they live in more of a concentrated area, they're easier to hunt in some ways. So they brought this to the attention of the provincial government and the provincial government used that knowledge to establish a closure for mountain goats in that area. So when both groups are working hand in hand, it can be pretty effective. The land use plan, we succeeded in getting buffers along our ecosystem networks. Uh, we have all growth management areas, we have wildlife management areas, we, well, areas that we're protecting for medicinal plants and areas for where we harvest our food. You talk to some of the licensees, they'll tell you that they recognize that land use plan as being a document that uh, they can abide by. And uh, currently we're trying to work with um, BC and in having government recognize the land use plan. So I think we've come a long way in hmm, 20 years. Yes, we'll recognize your rights, but we're not, not going to recognize that you have title. It's still crown land. And uh, that's been a difficult fight. Since we've had to you know, uh, seek recourse to the courts of this country to begin to get the courts to say, yes, you do have land, that you have Aboriginal title, that you have strong rights throughout the territory, and it's only going to that extent and a number of times that governments begin to change their attitude and enter into agreements with Gitanyao that says, yes, you do have land. This is the range of the territory. This is how you're organized. You have laws that we can respect and that Aboriginal title exists here. I think we can overcome uh, any difficulties uh, and we adapt to to change while holding on to the hereditary system and holding on to the traditional laws. Getting you have been signatories to the AFS, I'll call it, uh, since I believe 1997. Um, really, this, this fund was set up, I think, as a result of Sparrow, which uh, was a, a prominent court case that really changed the way governments managed uh, salmon resources and, and uh, paved the way to have Aboriginal people more involved in the management of, of salmon resources within their traditional territory. It sounds like there has been some funding provided by the province to allow Gitanyao along with other First Nations, uh, Nishka Nation, Teltan, and then the BC Ministry of Environment to work together over time to use the Northwest Transmission Line as a, somewhat of a case study to try to um, plan for cumulative impacts. So that's definitely a positive, positive thing that's come out of the, the transmission line assess, uh, environmental assessment. So we'll see where that goes. We want collaborative management with government and industry. Um, we want adaptive management practices with government and industry. Um, we want cultural sustainability. Uh, we want food security and medicinal security and water security and we want it for the seventh generation. I think all of us as hereditary chiefs will thrive to to use the knowledge that was handed down from uh, from other chiefs that have gone on. I think we rely on that inspiration. Now there's beginning to be more recognition by government and third parties that are operating on territory that, you know, recognition of title and a traditional structure, rights, you know, can coexist together and could be beneficial for everybody, not just Gitanya, but 
companies who come to the territory who want to invest. And that's actually created some level of certainty for everybody, not only for government, but for third parties, and particularly for us, that um, you know, these things can happen and, and coexist together.